violence really is, is my research interest and for now I'm looking at state obligations to address sexual violence. So I'm, now I'm going to talk about one case. It was a constitutional petition that I'm going to anchor my discussions around um, state obligations to address sexual violence um, by discussing this one case. It's called the 160 Girls case. So what happened, this was a constitutional petition that came before um, the High Court in Meru, Kenya. So it's a Meru County, it's a rural community with a High Court. And the case was basically, um, you know, advocated and marketed out. It became a real va uh, buzzword and a buzz case internationally, even before it was a buzz in the country. So it was this whole 160 girls case that basically 160 girls in Meru County took the government to court and they sued them um, for various issues around not effectively responding to their sexual violence accusations, you know, when they went and reported their sexual violence. But, the, and we'll talk about a bit later my problems with, with this case, but just to start with the whole 160 name of it, it's not actually a legal fact because it was marketed as 160 girls took the government to court, but it was a constitutional petition that had 11 petitioners who are girls, and then the 12th petitioner was um, the organization that supported this case. And the reason why 160, you know, the name came about was because they, there were a number of organizations involved. So Equality Effect is, is a you know, global organization, and they supported this case in terms of resource and capacity, and they engaged lawyers across the globe to do a lot of background research that fed into this public interest litigation case. And then there was Ripples International, which is an organization based in Meru County that sets up and establishes rescue centers for girls, children who've been victims of abuse. So these three organizations were sort of on the forefront. The rescue center at the time had supported 160 cases. So that's why they called it 160 girls case. But as I said, those 12 petitioners, 11 of them were girls who were aged between five and 15 years old who all lived in that county had been defiled, which is what we call the rape of children in my country, um, on several occasions by different people. Um, and they had reported to the police, but the police had, they'd experienced a lot of challenges with the police. For some, the case was never opened. For some, the police asked them for money, the usual. So secondary victimization generally. Um, and then those were the petitioners. The people who were sued, so it was the inspector general of, the inspector of police or the commissioner of police, and then the DPP was the second respondent, and the third was uh, the, the Ministry of Justice, which we had at the time. Now we don't anymore. So I'll take a bit of a detour before I go back to talk about the case. So the reason why, or how I'm speaking about this, really is from a point of understanding state obligations to address sexual violence. Actually, state obligations for human rights violations more broadly, but in this case for women's rights for violation of women's rights and violence against women in particular. So traditionally, the responsibility of states has always been understood as the state will be responsible if the act or omission is directly attributable to, to, to the state. So committed by the state or an agent of the state. Um, and and, and the, the International Law Commission draft articles on state responsibility has come up with two sort of main points that there's got to be an existing um, obligation in, in law that has been breached and then the state is got to be attributed to the state. But one long-standing exception to this main rule has been that the state was responsible for actions of private actors and non-state actors because the state has also a due diligence obligation to prevent and respond. And that also is an argument that has, you know, since Grotius, 17th century, etc., etc. But in the last 25 years has really grown that argument of the state has a due diligence obligation for actions of private actors. And a number of cases in the international and regional sort of um, judicial or quasi-judicial bodies, and even in national domestic settings, has crystallized this principle of the due diligence obligation of states. So I've just quoted a few of those cases. The Velasquez is the most referenced one about the disappearances, forced disappearances in Honduras, where the state of Honduras was held responsible for not preventing, not responding, not compensating the victims who went through that. Um, and the, the Fernandez was also a, a, a seminal case which was involving domestic violence actually and the state, Brazil was held responsible for 
not preventing, not effectively responding, not punishing, not prosecuting ETC. And then in South Africa, we have S versus Beloy, Beloy and a lot of others, um, which are, you know, they have wonderful language. I, one of S versus Beloy I love because it says, the state had a number of constitutional obligations to deal with domestic violence and to protect every individual's rights to be free from domestic violence. It is systematic, pervasive, overwhelmingly gender specific, reflects and reinforces patriarchal domination and, and does so in a particularly brutal form. So wonderful, languages has, wonderful language has been coming out of courts both at regional and national levels around due diligence obligation. And this case, the 160 girls case, was sort of the first um, Kenya's, so Kenya has basically entered the scene through this one case. Um, yeah. So how I understand due diligence is really as a tool, it's a, it's, a, it's a weapon, it's something that right holders can use to hold states accountable. Because a lot of the times we know these human rights obligations are just language and they mean very little. So the important question becomes what constitutes effective fulfillment of state obligations? Because now due diligence, due diligence allows us to, to question the state on actual, practical, tangible, measurable things. And one of the important contributions to this whole debate has been the Office of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, its causes and consequences. And from the first one, I think it was in the 90, early 90s, Dr. Ratika, they've since articulated what does it actually mean for the state to fulfill its obligations to effectively prevent and respond violence against women. And these are just some of the running themes that come out of all of the several reports they've done over the years that the state has got to ratify at least these international instruments, that the country has got to have constitutional guarantees in their own constitution, there's got to be laws, administrative sanctions for adequate redress for sexual violence, there's got to be policies or plans of action on violence against women, a gender sensitive criminal justice system, that there's got to be accessibility and availability of support services, and then the whole issue of awareness and modification of discriminatory policies in education and the media, that's around the whole prevention idea, and then data and statistics. And in 2014, there was a, a due diligence project, which is the framework I'm using for my broader PhD study on this, which really has also crystallized a bit more what does it mean to have these state obligations. So let's go back to the case. So as I was saying, there were girls, 11 of them, aged between 5 to 15, that took this public interest litigation case to court. And I've said they were raped by fathers, uncles, neighbors, name it, including one of the petitioners who was raped by a police officer. And the argument that they made is that all this, the fact that the police did not respond to them effectively constituted a failure to conduct, the failure to conduct prompt, effective, proper, professional investigations was a direct violation of their constitutional rights. And they listed a number of them. The Kenyan constitution is, is very good. So it listed the equality, freedom from discrimination on the basis of sex and age, human dignity, security of the person, protection from all forms of violence, all of those rights. And then they also relied on this international instrument. So the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the Convention on the, 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 the Children's, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, at the, the African Regional System, the African Children's Charter, the African, you know, Human and People's Rights, and then the CEDO. At some point, they even mentioned the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the one on Socioeconomic Rights. So that was basically the case. And f the respondents didn't really engage, as usual, for public interest litigation cases. They, you know, came in late to the party and didn't even file replying affidavits, but they, the first respondent was the Inspector General of Police. The third was the Ministry of Justice. Those two at least filed um, grounds of opposition. And they basically argued jurisdiction, you know, not good before the law, the usual, that they didn't exhaust options, that the, they actually said that the, the, the petitioners didn't highlight um, who, who, the, who the perpetrators really were, you know, and de detail all the details. So, but all of those were dismissed because, I mean, the, the court just you know, gave the provisions of the constitution that allowed these people to take that case, that they had jurisdiction ETC. And even said that actually the 11 petitioners had documented through using social workers with that organization, the names of all the, the, the perpetrators of those cases. They knew them, they were around. And the DPP, who was the second respondent, argued that 
he was wrongfully enjoined in the case because, according to an article of the Constitution, he had actually directed the police to do their job. Um, but when they, the, the court uh, read the petition, the affidavits of the petitioners found out that that had only happened for two of the petitioners and not 11 of them. Okay. So on a systematic level, the case was, was, was a success because it argued that the police in action created a climate of tolerance and impunity which created you know, that lack of fear for legal consequence among perpetrators and just general society, which, con which led to continued acts of violence. And the court agreed with that. So in the judgment, the court, this case was seminal because the court agreed with that systematic, you know, that violence is systematic, it's not just, you know, individual level. And the judgment was also good because it, these are some of the powerful things that it came out. And the, the last two at least, that it held the state indirectly responsible for the rape, indirectly responsible for the actions of the perpetrators, and directly responsible for the psychological and emotional um, that, the, that the, the survivors went through because of police mistreatment. In terms of orders, it was a bit shallow. So the, it gave the general declarations, which basically restated the rights that were just of those conventions that I've quoted. It was nothing special. It was nothing contentious. It didn't clarify any legal uncertainty. And then it just ordered them to implement a general article of the Constitution, Article 244, which establishes the National Police Service to basically investigate ETC. And then it asked them to investigate those 11 cases. So, and it denied the rest. And the rest, the three of them were actually policy oriented. So it was um, actually to, uh, to, to, to require the Ministry of Justice to implement a guideline for prosecutors uh, to implement the Sexual Offences Act, which the court denied. And the other one was to, to basically establish a, a policy framework, which the Sexual Offences Act requires the government to do so, which they haven't, the court denied. And the third one was a supervisory one, so that you will report to court every so often to check, which the three of them were denied, which I think were the crooks of why that case was filed as a public interest litigation. So there was some deference there. Um, that we saw. So I've said why really it was a success because it, it met the, the, the needs of the individual petitioners and it recognized systematic violence, which for the first time in Kenya at least has happened. But I find that they also have you know, some missed opportunities in this case. The first one is that it looked at this case from a policing only issue, as though investigation literally for sexual violence is a police affair. And we know that's, that, that, that's not true because investigation for sexual violence cases, especially when most of them are cold cases, so you wouldn't get your typical 72 hour case where evidence is perfect, there's forensic evidence, conviction is easy. You'll get the one where you literally need the social worker and the counselor and everyone to support the survivor because your best case is having a strong com complainant who's going to testify and not break down at chief examination in chief, not just cross examination. So they didn't recognize the interrelatedness and the interlinkages. Um, that happened in investigation. And in the interviews I've been doing, some of the quotes that have been coming out really just show the police themselves are at a loss. It's like, we don't really know, we don't think investigation is our role even, the way that it's properly so defined. Um, and, and that's a problem, not just for the way the court reasoned, but for the way the petition has laid out the case, which is a reflection for us who want to do this kind of work. And then the other one was the judgment, despite the fact that these were 11 girls, it did not have agenda analysis to this violence. It was simply argued out as a defilement case, child abuse period, which is very problematic and, 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 and it's a loss because we know this, it will problematize that whole neutrality approach. And I have a problem particularly with the whole, oh, but children are innocent, let's protect them. So violence, defilement against children is one, you know, it's terrible. So Kenya has this thing now where the cases that are coming out, the jurisprudence around defilement is, 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 is not very good because it seems to value the innocence of children and, and basically protect them based on that, not because they're human beings and need to be protected. So you find when the child is not acting as innocent as the court wants, it, wants the child to act, especially for girls, then the judgments actually read like this one case, I hope someone can ask me that in the question time because there's no time now. And basically they, as long as they start <laughs> acting as, as women, then they can be raped, you know, they can protect themselves. So. And then my, my other that I think was a missed opportunity is the, is, is the fact that they, there was no you comprehensive use of the international women's rights frameworks. So the you know, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, social, it was, someone asked me also about that. 
So there was no, but they didn't use a comprehensive use of the, the women's rights frameworks, even if you're going to make a declaration, at least make it on the substantive language that we now have and not, yeah, so I'll finish with these questions. Um, the case really was groundbreaking because it basically domesticated that due diligence principle and it brought it home. So now it's paved a way for us to hold the state accountable based on that, which is great. But beyond being important to lawyers, I don't see how this case, what it actually means to the girls. Um, and I, I also don't see why it's a public interest, it, I don't see why it had to be a public interest litigation case in the way that it ended. Um, because in as much as it was publicized as a media campaign, I don't think that whatever has seemed, seems to have been achieved by this case needed to be achieved through this public interest litigation case. It might as well just have been a public awareness campaign that could have achieved those things. So, thank you.